Hello anatomy friends, this is Dr. Alsup, and you cannot have a back and spinal cord session without talking about the vertebrae. And so we're going to talk through some structures that are going to be common to almost all of the vertebrae. And we're looking at a superior view of the three movable types of vertebrae or examples of each one. This will be the cervical, this will be the thoracic, and this will be the lumbar. Um, we talked a little bit in the learning objective videos as to how to determine which one is which. Uh, right now we're going to focus on just some of those structures that you have in all of them. So the large anterior bodies are going to be um, just as you would think, one of the largest structures associated with the vertebrae. You can see how very large they are in the lumbar vertebrae. They look almost heart-shaped in the thoracic vertebrae or in many of the thoracic vertebrae. And um, they're, they're going to be relatively large for the cervical as well, even though overall these are smaller vertebrae. And then extending from the, the body, you'll have these short extensions, little feet, as we call the pedicles. You can see a bit of it right in this region here. So the pedicles are going to be part of that vertebral arch. It is going to meet with the laminae and you can see the laminae are these flat plates of bone, a little bit more com uh, complex when you're looking at the lumbar region. Um, but these are going to be more, so if the body is anterior, the laminae are going to be more posteriorly uh, facing. The transverse processes are going to extend laterally as part of that vertebral arch. You can see that they vary very quite a bit in terms of what they look like dependent on region. So you can see how um, short they are when you're talking about the cervical vertebrae. And in some of the cervical vertebrae, they could be bifid, meaning that they're kind of separated into two processes. Here is a thoracic uh, vertebrae's transverse process. And you can th see they, are, they extend quite a bit laterally in the lumbar region, but are a little bit thinner. The spinous processes are going to be our most posteriorly projecting uh, processes. And these are the ones that if you kind of run your hand down the midline of your back, you are feeling those spinous processes because that's about as posterior as you can get, right? And you can see that there's going to be differences between the types of vertebrae, uh, but you can see in terms of the cervical, again, you could have an example of a bifid process also associated with the spinous process. And then, of course, all of these vertebrae are going to have a vertebral foramen. And if you join all these vertebral foramina together throughout the vertebral column, you get the vertebral canal where you have the spinal cord, the roots of the spinal nerves, meninges, and epidural fat sitting in that region. Now looking at a lateral view, you can get a better view of the definitely the vertebral notches. Really, you can only see these vertebral notches from these lateral views. And we can also see some of these other structures that we're going to get to. So articular processes are going to um, have projections for which you're going to have those facet joints. And so you'll have a superior articular process articulating with an inferior articular process of another vertebrae. So you can see a superior one right here in terms of the articular process and an inferior one. And you can kind of see them extending throughout these regions. The notches, like I said, you're only going to see on a lateral view. And you can see very nicely on the lumbar vertebrae. And I meant to say that we're looking at a cervical, a thoracic, and a lumbar again. So kind of from the superior down to inferior. So if we're looking at this lumbar vertebrae, you have a really nice example of a superior vertebral notch and an inferior vertebral notch. And so in this lateral view you have, and typically these transverse processes, particularly, or excuse me, the spinous processes, particularly in the thoracic vertebrae, are going to be sloping downwards. They all have a little bit of a slope. And so that, that's how you can kind of get an idea of which one's going to be inferior and which one's going to be superior.
And then if you put the vertebral notches together for neighboring vertebrae, you will have these intervertebral foramina. And you can see them throughout the entirety of the vertebral column. And these are going to allow for the spinal nerves or the trunks of the spinal nerves and those primary rami to leave the vertebral column. All right, moving to the immovable vertebrae, uh, we will reach the sacrum. The sacrum is going to articulate with obviously L5 at about this region here, and then you will have it articulating with the hip bones for your sacroiliac joints. We're looking at an anterior view here and a posterior view. So right off the bat, you can see this posterior view looks a bit more complex. You have um, very small remnants of the spinous processes in some of these regions. And if you get down to about the level of S4 or S5, particularly S5, you will see that you do not even have a lamina or a spinous process. So you have a complete absence of those two structures. And that region right here is referred to as the sacral hiatus, and that sacral hiatus will lead into the sacral canal, and here's the beginning of the sacral canal, um, where you have that nervous tissue kind of passing through, similar to the, the vertebral canal, so it's just an extension of that vertebral canal. The sacral hiatus is um, not a pathology, this is something that you will see in most individuals. You'll have these very prominent sacral foramina. So if you're looking at the anterior side, these would be anterior sacral foramina. And then if you're looking at the posterior side with those little remnants of the spinous processes, then you know you're looking at the posterior sacral foramina. Obviously they are going to be continuous with one another. There are typically four pairs of these sacral foramina and this will allow the exit of the ventral and dorsal primary rami of those sacral, from the sacral levels. The coccyx is going to be also an immovable portion of the vertebral column. It is typically, this is not going to be a weight bearing portion of the vertebral column. And this portion right here is going to be the coccyx. Oops, sorry, I cut it off a little bit there. And then you can see a bit of it down in this region here. So that inferior most <clears throat> portion of the vertebral column. It's going to be the fusion of four or approximately four rudimentary coccygeal vertebrae. That number can be variable. And coccyg the coccygeal vertebrae number one may remain separate from the rest of the coccyx. As you can see, that is the case here with this individual. Uh, these last three or the most inferior three coccygeal vertebrae typically fuse during around the middle ages of your life and these are definitely the most rudimentary of the vertebrae in, in terms of size. All right, let's talk about a few of the special vertebrae, the ones that are very unique in terms of presentation and or may have some specific clinical significance. We are looking at the C1 or atlas here. This is C2 or the axis. And then this is the articulation between the two bones here. C1 is the bone that is going to articulate with the skull or with the cranium. Uh, with these large um, processes that will articulate with the occipital condyles of the cranium. And this bone also is very distinctly ring shaped, as you can see here. And it will have no spinous process and no body. So that is pretty unique in terms of the vertebrae. And I said this is C1, but also called Atlas. Think of Atlas of Greek mythology holding the world or bearing the weight of the world on his shoulders. Well, C1 is bearing the weight of the skull. C1 um, carrying that skull or the cranium is going to rotate on C2 to allow that shaking you get with, when you shake your head no. And you can see here that dens is going to superiorly project. So this dens right here is that projection you can see right here on C2. 
It's going to project superiorly from the body of C2, and it will serve as that pivot about which the head rotation occurs, or that C1 rotation occurs that carries the head. C7, or often uh, referred to as the vertebra prominens, and you can kind of get here, I can count from bodies, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, look at what's going on here. You have this very prominent spinous process associated with C7. It's typically the most prominent spinous process, even though T1 and sometimes C6 uh, can have very close in terms of the, prominence of the spinous process. Um, it typically is usually that most superior process that is visible through the skin, um, even visible sometimes without flexing uh, the vertebral column. And so you can use that. You can see it first of all and get an idea of about which vertebral level you're at just by looking at an individual and oftentimes by if you need to palpate as well. And that can help in terms of if you're having to enter a needle into that region or do some type of surgery, you have an idea of about where you're at there. And last but not least, I can't not talk about transverse foramina because I think they are so cool. Um, cervical vertebrae have this very unique foramen. So not that vertebral foramen, which is right in the middle here, but these two foramina that are associated with the transverse process of the cervical vertebrae. And you only have transverse foramina in cervical vertebrae. And that's very unique if you're ever trying to identify one. Even if you're looking, if I go back to C1 and C2, you can't see it all that well in C2, but they're there. Um, so you know you're looking at a cervical vertebra, and this allows for the vertebral artery, which is a branch of the subclavian artery, which is all the way in the root of the neck. It allows for that vertebral artery to ascend up through the neck all the way up to within the skull, and it's going to be one of the two dominant suppliers of, our, of blood to the brain. So a very important route by which that artery is protected in its way up to be able to supply that all-important brain. All right, excellent. So that was a lot of vertebrae fun. There is a lot to kind of look at in terms of this. And as you're reviewing, you know, take time really looking at th these vertebrae and trying to ID on your own. And if you work through this and you find areas that you need a bit more clarification, please, please always feel free to reach out. Thank you for your time and attention here and have a great rest of your day.